Good evening and welcome to Cola Baptist Church. Would you stand and sing with me? Our first song is going to be Oh How I Love Jesus, number 69 in your books if you need it. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its birth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Thank you. Good singing. You may be seated. All right, good evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Um, Pastor and Miss Dana are away. For those of you who did not know, they get to go and take a little quick trip and go see that grandbaby, okay, of theirs up in San Francisco. So you pray for them as they travel. Uh, I know a lot of other people are traveling. There's also flu going around, so continue to be in prayer for one another. And, uh, but I hope that you guys are having a great week so far, okay, and I'm glad that you can be here tonight, and we can be here for prayer meeting and for Bible study. So um, we'll start off with this before we have our, our offering time. We have a couple of our missionary letters, okay, so for our missionary moment, I'll start with the labels from Mexico, and it starts with this. It says, greetings for, from Cuernavaca. Thank you for praying for us. And then he goes on to say that Vic, he had, a, uh, he had an opportunity to teach Zoom class, and this, was, this really piqued my interest because it says he finished teaching the first semester of poetry books, okay, class in December. And so that piqued my interest because I have the privilege and I have the honor of teaching uh, poetical books in the Bible this semester. So I was really excited to hear that. It's good to know that the people all across the world, okay, are learning from the same Bible and they're learning the same truths from the Word of God. So he's very heavily involved with that. He, he also mentioned that he's teaching apologetics and homiletics. Okay, for those of you who don't know what apologetics or homiletics are, okay, um, ask Brother Jim, grumbling in the back, okay. Um, um, uh, teaching them how to preach and teaching them how to study the Word of God, teaching them how to defend their faith. Okay, so that's very exciting. All, the, all these church members are getting some good Bible study in. Um, for on, on, on Joyce's side, uh, she started a woman's home Bible study in December. And so if you could pray for her, they're going through a book called 12 Extraordinary Women. Some of you may be familiar with it. And so they're all also able to reach out there and have ladies' Bible studies. Um, Joyce is struggling with scoliosis. I think that was mentioned uh, a couple months ago. Um, so just continue to pray for her. She's going through um, some treatment with a chiropractor and a therapist. And some of you know what it's like to go through that kind of thing. So just continue to pray for her as she improves. Um, continue to pray for the Bible and book ministry. Um, they need more Bibles. Okay, if you want to get involved in a ministry like that and donating Bibles, um, they always need those kinds of things. Uh, and the last thing that they end with is they ask for prayer for a couple of their local pastors. They're, uh, Pastor Arturo Sotelo is their names, and Pastor Angel Rojas. They are the main pastors that we are assisting at the time. So just continue to pray for the work there. Um, all these children's clubs and all these uh, ladies' Bible studies and all these, these um, 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 Bible college-type classes that uh, they're able to teach, I uh, pray that it bears fruit in these uh, local churches. And uh, again, so this is from Vic and Joyce LaBelle, okay, from Mexico, all right? Um, on the second front, okay, all the way, almost on the other side of the world, okay, we have John and Alicia Walls, okay, to Taiwan. Um, one of the, uh, well, let me just start by saying this, okay, it's, uh, the title uh, is exciting because it says, Update on Four Church Plants. Some of you may have remembered from last year, we got to watch a really, really exciting video where he took us around their new properties, and he showed us on, on kind of like a bird's eye view of the map of Taiwan, 
and um, all these all these church plants so there's four of them okay so pray for in order compass baptist second mile baptist second birth baptist and cross baptist church um maybe we just want to uh, highlight second baptist church second baptist church up there in the top right okay of the screen there uh the pastor of uh, the pastoral intern his name is josh wong and he's 23 years old and he's led this church plant on his own ever since they started this their fourth church plant in nanzi okay so this has given a, uh, a chance for josh to um get his feet wet get his hands dirty okay in ministry and he's just a young man think about it, 23 years old and he is part of a church plant there and he's just one of the four churches that we're praying for so exciting things are going on in taiwan so continue to pray for them with their church plants a lot of the the missionary letter um, talks about uh, needing permits and, and getting funds um, of course getting people in you know things like advertising and 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 material needs and just finishing up the property so continue to pray for john and alicia walls uh, they close out uh, by talking about um, their uh, Christmas outreach that will be held on Christmas Eve. So this is a little bit dated, okay, for us. But um, uh, just be thinking about what they have been doing there. And, and we're, we're praying for uh, the next letter, the next mission letter to come to hear about all that fruit that comes from their Christmas ministry. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of their, their, their different pastors. Pastor Sam is the, 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 uh, the pastor at Second Mile Baptist. Uh, pastor Peyton is the pastor at Compass Baptist. Again, past the, the intern Josh Wong is over there at Second Birth Baptist in the top right, and then Cross Baptist Church. Okay, so think of these four churches, if you would. Think of the um, LaBelles in Mexico in your prayers. Um, I'm going to ask the men to come forward and we take our um, offering this evening. Continue to be in prayer for one another as well. A lot of people are struggling with health issues. Um, pray for uh, Taiwan. Pray for Mexico. Pray for... Um, um, I almost don't want to mention it, okay, but this is... Um, we, got, we got to say goodbye formally to the Stills family on a Sunday night, but this is their officially, 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 their last church service, um, unless something happens. I don't know, okay, but they're leaving on Sunday, so we won't get to see them, so make sure you say hello to them, and uh, a lot of other good things, so continue to pray for our missionaries. You'll see some missionaries and more details on them on the slides that are to follow. Brother Jim Grumley, would you mind opening us up in prayer? Lord, we're thankful for uh, this place we can come and hear your word preached to us, and uh, have an effect on us, Lord, that we might uh, be Christ-like. And I pray a uh, blessing on the offering. Thank you for prospering us throughout the week, Lord, and all the many blessings uh, you give each day, things we don't even, we don't even know about, Lord. And uh, we thank you for your love and kindness to us. And uh, bless these tithes and offerings. Give us wisdom how to use them best for your uh, increase in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand once again and sing our next song is I Love to Tell the Story.
of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet, I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Our next song will be His Mercy is More. The choir introduced this recently. Hopefully you remember it. Any choir members out there, sing this one out loud. Help everyone learn it. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Good singing, you may be seated. Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. two. We won't be there for very long, just as an introduction, okay? I'm going to be flipping all over the place this evening, okay? But... I want to start off tonight with a little bit of a story. I almost had forgotten about this story. Do you guys ever have <laughs> you guys ever have memories that you, you try to repress? You guys ever have a traumatic experience when you were a child? Don't raise your hand, okay? I know we all have them, okay? And at some point in time, I would like to hear your traumatic stories because I usually, we usually get a good laugh about them, right? Because, oh, that was 20 years ago. That was 30 years ago. Can we get a good laugh? Well, this is one of my repressed memories, okay? Um, <laughs> recently, we went to, um, 
And I was reminded because every year, okay, this is, this is a pro tip, okay? I don't think we have any little kids in here. We only have like, what, sixth graders? Where are my teenagers at? Okay, we only get like sixth graders, okay? So this is a pro tip, but I don't want to put any undue pressure on you adults, okay? But this is a pro tip. At our school, okay, well, any school, it doesn't matter, okay, we got, we got our report cards back, okay, and some of you may be varying levels of, of, of elation or disappointment. Am I right, parents? Okay, all right, we look at them, and you know, sometimes you got that smart kid, and sometimes you have that not so smart kid, and then sometimes you have that kid that no longer lives in your house because he's no longer allowed to live there anymore because he got below C level or D level, and he's got to, he's got to kick him out, he's got to go on his own, okay? But anyway, you, you bring your, and some of you guys, old school, you guys know if you bring your report card, if you bring your report card to Fun Factory, we, have, we get one Fun Factory. I don't know if you guys know we have a mall in town. I forget that we have a mall because I never go there, okay? But we have a mall and they have a Fun Factory. And if you bring your report card and you have all A's or mostly A's and some B's, you can get free tokens. Well, they don't even use tokens anymore. They use the co so every semester, I, every semester or at the end of every quarter rather, okay, I try, I try to get my kids to forget. I don't mention it all. I don't mention it at all. But every once in a while, a light bulb goes off in one of my five kids' heads, and they go, Daddy, can we take our report cards to Fun Factory and get free tokens? And I go, well, okay, I guess we got to go, okay? I mean, because, you know, we want to reward our kids. Anyway, so I was reminded of this because we went to, we, we, they, they, they have discovered it, okay? They, they, they kind of remembered, oh, Daddy, Daddy, we got our report cards. Do we have our report cards yet? Have they seen them yet, Mrs. Marisol? Have they seen them? I don't think they have, okay? And they've been asking, so I'm kind of dreading it because I really don't want to go to Fun Factory because I have bad memories of Fun Factory. Now, this is a different Fun Factory. When I was growing up, my Fun Factory was the one in Pearl Ridge, okay? Um, rest in peace because it's no longer there. I think there's something ridiculous there, like an exercise place or something. Ridiculous. Okay, what are we going to do with that? Okay, but the, that was my fun factory. They sold corn dogs and they sold ice cream out front and just even, I didn't even have to go into the fun factory. It was just beautiful walking next to it, seeing the lights, smelling the corn dogs, and it was an exciting thing. And whenever I could, well, I never really got good grades, so I never really got to go to fun factory for free. So when I got to go to fun factory, it was special. Usually it was because, and I think I've told you guys this story before, my grandmother, every year, she would send me a dollar for every year how old I was, okay? So you guys can do the math, right? Okay, when I was nine, I got nine dollars. Oh, I was, that was rich back in 1987 or whatever that was, okay? Um, oh, brah, I mean, I can't even do math. That's, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't nine in 1987, but whatever, okay, you guys get it. When I was 10, I got a, I remember this, I remember I got a crisp $10. That was more money than I had seen in my entire life. And you better know, the next time we went to the mall, I took that money. This is a separate story, but I blew the whole thing in about 30 minutes. I think I've told this story before, okay? Felt sick to my stomach. But while I was doing it, spent my entire birthday money all at Fun Factory, I, I, and it ran out quick. It was gone in like 30 minutes. I mean, the thing was gone. You know, I was playing Bonk the Alligator. I was shooting the clown's teeth out. I was, I was shooting laser beams at aliens. I was doing all kinds of things. It was gone in 30 minutes, okay? Well, well that's no fun, Okay? Nowadays, you know, kids nowadays, you just play on the phone. They can keep playing video games until the, 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 kind, the battery dies. No, 30 minutes and my fun was done. There was no way that I was going to stand for that. So I started wandering around, just hoping. You know how it is? You know, back in the day, you used to, like, stick your finger inside the little slots and maybe hope there was, like, a loose coin. Oh, man, looking around, looking for a loose tickets so I could buy, like, a parachute army man or whatever it was. And I remember wandering around, and then I, I saw a part of Fun Factory, Levi, that I had never seen before. Because I usually stayed with the fun stuff, you know, the lasers and the aliens and all that kind of other stuff. And I wandered by a part of Fun Factory that I'd never been before. It was mesmerizing, okay? L let me see, I'll describe it to you, and you guys tell me if you guys have ever seen something like this, okay? It was a giant glass encased structure. It was in the shape of a diamond, okay? So it's, it looks like a diamond, but inside of this glass clear diamond shape, there was, to my eyes, millions of gold coins. How can I get my hands on that? Because if I get some of those coins, I can play more video games. That was my, that was my reasoning, okay, in my whatever, nine-year-old, ten-year-old head. But the key was, you had to stick in a coin so that the little pusher thing could push some of those coins over the edge. Does this sound familiar to some of you? Okay, they, they were basically, it, it was a casino, people. It was a casino for kids. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? That's what a fun factory is, okay? So you have to stick, you gotta stick the coin in and the thing falls down and the arm pushes and you hope maybe that this stack of, 
a million gold coins would fall down the chute and you would get all of them. But here's the thing, I was a dummy and I spent all of my coins. So what do you think I did? I walked up to, I'm just hoping, Lord, please, let the gravity, let gravity do its work. I, I, I mean, I, I remember walking around that glass case repeatedly. You know, like Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, hoping that maybe I, if I blow hard enough, the thing will fall. No, it didn't happen. And so I decided to take matters into my own hands. Some of you have done this, I can tell, because you're laughing. I walk, don't do this at home, kids. Teenagers, listen to me, okay? I walked up to that glass-encased treasure chest of filthy mammon, <laughs> And I, in my mind, it was the lightest of taps, okay? You know, like a little stiff arm, you know, in football, like a line, but whoa, give it a little stiff arm. I thought it was the lightest of taps for a nine or 10 year old, however old I was. But what happened after felt like an earthquake because an alarm started sounding. I froze, okay? You know, fight or flight? Okay, I was not gonna fight and I wasn't gonna run either. I see this dude, this, I remember to this day, I can remember his face. He wore a red polo. He had glasses, brown hair, and a beard. I mean, he looked as intimidating to a nine-year-old as, as, as an adult could get. He had some keys dangling off his chest. He had Funk Factory in, embroidered right here on the side. And in his big red shirt, he walks up to me and says, who did this? He looking around, and he, it's, he looked at me, and it was like he was looking into my soul. And I went away for 10 years. I'm just kidding. No, I mean, I, 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 I thought I was going to jail. I thought I was going to jail, Miss Becky. I thought. I thought I was going to jail. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I, I started to do the thing. I started putting my hands behind my back, okay, you know. I was waiting for him to read me my rights. But he said, young man, don't you ever do that again. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't even know if I said sorry. I was so traumatized. I thought I was going to jail for the rest of my life. And he said, I said, I'm watching you, okay. I don't want to see you ever touch that again. And I don't even know what happened. The next thing I know, it was like I blacked out, and then, and then I got out into the mall. I don't know what happened. And then, I, and then it was even worse because I started seeing this guy. No joke. I saw him over and over again. He was riding the escalator. There he's again, <laughs> reminding me of my near felony, okay? And, 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 and from that day forward, I was traumatized every time I went near a fun factory. I don't think I ever went back to that fun factory until, until I was like, like five, six years later, until I was a teenager. I couldn't stomach it because I knew that I had done something wrong. Okay. Well, tonight, that's what we're talking about, okay? In, in, um, in, our, in our Wednesday night series with our kids, okay, we've been going through this uh, series called Counterculture, okay? And some of you guys may remember this because <laughs> we started it in 2019, and we never really got to finish it because of, well, you know, three years of chaos that happened. So we kind of restarted it last year, and we're making our way through it, okay? But one of the things that we are on, our topic that's coming up next is morality, okay? You guys know what morality is? You guys know what morality is? Can somebody give me a good definition of what morality is? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, there are no wrong answers. Just kidding. Okay, that's the definition of morality. Okay, oh, what is it? What is it, Blaze? Blaze is my Bob Cross. What's that? The ability to die. Add a T, and you would be cor completely correct. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's my pigeon accent. I'm sorry. Morality, M-O-R, I don't even know if I can spell it, I'm from Wine. M-O-R-A-L-I-T, morality, not mortality, close. That's a good one, you guys remember that one, okay. It does have to do with death though, life and death, yes. Is that Cameron, what's up Cameron, what's up my brother? What's morality? Right and wrong, even a little kid knows, okay. Not that you're little Cameron, okay, he's a very big kid, I'm sorry Cameron, you're a big boy. Okay, morality. Even children know the basic, because I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old, and I knew at that moment when the red polo was coming my way and the red <laughs> was flashing, I knew I had done something very, very wrong. I didn't know exactly what I did, but I knew it was wrong. I knew in my heart that I wanted to get something, okay, in this child casino, okay, that didn't really belong to me, okay, and that's morality, okay, at the, at the basic, okay. Now, um, Mike, can we go to the next slide? I think, I think my clicker is, is dead. It, it, try it again. Oh, there we go, okay. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, okay, but morality, okay, it's very small. So what we're talking about tonight, we're, gonna start, we're starting off this study in, in youth group, and we're going to probably be here for the next couple weeks. But we're talking about morality, and it, and it is, at, at its simplest definition, it is the difference between right and wrong, okay. Now, after we define morality as a simple thing, okay, you also have to ask yourself, 
probably two other questions, maybe more, okay? But I, all I came up with was two, okay? Once we define morality, the difference between right and wrong, you probably have to ask yourself two more questions. Number one, is there actually right and wrong, okay? Do you know what I'm talking about? Because some things that I think is right may not be the same thing that you think is right. Some people who live in different cultures, some people who live at different time, okay, periods, different, different eras of history, they may not have the same definition of what is right and wrong than you. You may even have differences of opinion on what is right and wrong in your own family. So for some people, they just want to go, oh, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Everybody gets to make their own choices. We call this, the fancy way, we call this relative morality versus absolute morality. This is kind of along the same framework. This is kind of along the same lines of, of, of truth. Does one plus one always equal two? Or is there some nation, some country, some alternate universe, okay, some other school where one plus one may not always equal two? Maybe it's three, maybe it's four, maybe it's 11. One plus one, get it? Okay. Truth. Is lying always wrong? Is it always wrong to lie? Or are there exceptions? Okay, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Is there really something such as right and wrong? And and you have to go back and you have to go through the framework of morality. You have to go back to existence itself. It's not necessarily is there a right or wrong. It's, it's also the question, who gets to define what right and wrong is? You know, for most of us, we grew up in that big man in the red polo with the beard and the glasses. Well, he was bigger and tall. He was an adult. So even if I could argue with the man, okay, he would win because he's bigger, taller. He's an adult. A lot of times that's how we look at, at, at morality, right, as, as, as children. We look and we say, you know what, mom and dad say this is right and wrong. The government says this is right and wrong, okay, but I disagree. And when I get older, when I move out, when I change my country, when I change my occupation, when I change my, whatever it is, I will get to define what is right and wrong. But is it really us? Is it really man who should def uh, define what is right and wrong? Okay, and it all goes back to the question, ultimately, of existence. Now, bear with me, okay, because with the kids, you know, we, we've been doing this long running study, and some of you guys may have heard me speak about this before, but morality really goes back to the question of existence. And we dealt with the question of existence in a study a month ago, okay, about um, existence, okay, and we started off with some very basic questions, okay? The very first basic question that we have is, well, who am I, okay? In the framework of the universe, in the framework of truth, in the framework of morality, in the framework of right and wrong, you have to define whether or not you are capable of making the decision of what is right or wrong. And that's why we're in Genesis chapter number two. Genesis chapter number two, you guys perhaps know this is the creation story. And this again, just as a simple framework, you always got to go back to the beginning. And let me read for you this, okay? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter two, verse number seven, okay? We, we, we went through the whole creation of the world. God created everything on six days. And then on the seventh day, he rested. And then he elaborates and he talks more about it. The Bible, he elaborates more on the creation of man. The Bible says in verse number 7, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Ha, aloha. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then out of the ground, God, uh, I'm sorry, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and then we come to something very specific, and it says there was one last tree, and it was the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. What's that? That's morality. That's a question of existence, truth. All of these things are wrapped up in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is morality? What's the difference between right and wrong? Well, who gets to define what is right and wrong? Well, as I read Genesis, it's not me, because... God created me, okay? We, we went through this question of existence about a month ago in youth group, and we talked, and we asked this question, and, and we finished, we, we, we came together with this phrase, I am, that means I exist, I am created, because God, because God created all things, okay? But number three, I am created in God's image, okay? And as I very often have told the teenagers over and over and over again, okay, uh, one, of the quote, oh, one of my favorite quotes, Fyodor, Fyodor Dostoevsky, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. Morality, 
the definition of right and wrong, it stems from, it has to stem from someplace other than us because mankind, in all his wisdom, has contributed to, just in the last century, two world wars, nuclear holocaust, okay, Not, or Jewish holocaust, rather, okay, nuclear bombs, okay, wars and fightings and, and, uh, and all these things. If mankind is such a moral creature, then why do we live in such a fallen world? And the, reason, and, and, and the answer is, is that mankind, not just this last century, not just the last millennia, but since the very beginning of time, since the very beginning of Genesis, has lived according to his own morality, and man's morality, man's sense of what is right and what is wrong, is flawed. It's broken. And we cannot depend upon man for morality, because if you and I depend on man for morality, we will get ourselves into trouble quick. And that's just the last century. Communism, Nazism, okay, uh, socialism, all these different things that, that, that we've gone through, all these different things. So I am, I am created, I am created in God's image, and as I like to tell the teenagers, as to sum it all up, if God made all things, here's the ultimate test of morality, then God gets to make the rules. God gets to say what is right, and God gets to say what is wrong. Now, that's just review, Okay. Tonight, I want to start off uh, as our introduction, okay, of morality, okay? So we define what morality is. We define where morality should come from. Now we are going to define, okay, morality, and we're going to take a little bit of a section of morality that I want to call discernment, okay? I read a great quote um, last year, or maybe it was a couple of years ago. I think I was reading Lectures to My Students by C.H. Spurgeon. Great book. I have it on my shelf. And the Prince of Preachers... He said, this is what discernment is. Because you and I, it's, it's, hard, enough, it's hard enough teaching morality to young kids, but, but most of us, we, we, we know the, the basic definition between what is right and what is wrong. You know, we have things like the Ten Commandments. We learned that since we're very young. Oh, but the difficulty comes in the shades of gray that develop in our life as we grow older. Oh, things are, things are very simple. When I was nine years old and I shook that jewel casino thing, okay, and that, that was very clear. I was trying to steal Oh, but the older that you get, the grayer the world becomes. Discernment, C.H. Spurgeon says, is not a matter of telling the difference between right and wrong. That's morality. Morality is right and wrong. There's another level of morality called discernment. The Bible talks about it. We're going to talk about it tonight. And discernment is, rather, it is telling the difference between right and almost right. Now, I think most of us, at some point in time, we get to the point where we understand basic morality. But if you guys are like me, I struggle with, well, discernment. Not just, not what was right and wrong. I, I learned those things when I was a kid. I learned lying was wrong, and adultery was wrong, and murder was wrong, and, 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 and all, those, all those Ten Commandments. But man, I really struggle with uh, right and almost right. Another way that we're going to talk about it on Wednesdays is there's bad, but there's also good, and there's also better, and there's also best. Sometimes it's a difficulty telling the difference between those. Sometimes God wants us to choose the best, and we only choose what is good. And that's discernment, okay? And so to start off with discernment, um, let's start in Proverbs. I'm going to take you guys to four passages, I'm, and I have four things tonight. If you're taking notes, Proverbs chapter number one. Let's go to Proverbs chapter number one. Discernment. If I could give you guys a, um, um, uh, 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 the biblical definition of discernment, okay? The biblical definition of discernment, okay, in the, in the New Testament, the, the uh, Hebrews chapter 5, which is a passage we're also going to go to. In Hebrews chapter 5, it talks about discernment, or the word discern. The word discernment comes from the Greek word diachrisis, okay? Uh, discernment, diachrisis, okay? Its, it's, it's base meaning is judicial estimation. You have to make a decision. That's, that's basically what it is. Just like a judge, he has to pound the gavel and he has to make a decision, a judicial decision. You and I, sometimes we live in a world of gray and a judge has a difficult job. He has to sit there and he has to decide not just between right and wrong, but sometimes he has to decide between right and almost right or who is more right or sometimes who is more wrong. That's the difficulty of being a judge. And it takes wisdom, it takes years of experience, it takes training, it takes schooling, it takes empathy, it takes compassion. 
And you and I, we need to apply that same level of, 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 of work into our own spiritual life. You see, discernment is not just judicial estimation. The root goes back to the idea of being able to separate or make distinction. Yes, between right and wrong, but also, like Spurgeon says, right and almost right. Um, I was thinking about this today. I was talking, oh, I was talking with Levi, okay? This afternoon, we were talking about going for taco. I haven't got any taco this Christmas season. I've been craving taco poke, okay? So maybe me, me and Levi, we're going to go sooner, okay? We're going to go poke squid out there in the bay. And I had heard recently, okay, that some of our fishing laws had changed, okay? And this is where discernment comes into play. You know, it, it, we use discernment in everyday things, practical things. I had heard recently that two or three years ago, okay, some of our fishing laws had changed. You know, I, I've known a lot of the basic laws, but some of them have changed, okay? And, and they're very specific. You know, here in Hawaii, we, have a, we, have, we don't have unlimited resources. We need to be good stewards of, 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 of the mauna. We need to be good stewards of, of, of the land. We need to be good stewards of, of, of the ocean that God has given to us. And by and large, you know, Hawaii, we don't have too many rules, but we got some, you know, like for our fishing laws, you know, Hawaii DLNR, our fishing laws, okay? We have all kinds of ways that you need to discern. Like if you're going to go for taco, the thing, you know, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go on that men's night dive, okay? Your taco has to be at least one pound, okay? A lot of people don't know that, okay? If the thing is too small, throw them back, okay? One pound. It has to be at least one pound. Um, length. Sometimes it's length, Okay. And some of you guys know, if you guys have ever been diving underwater, it's really hard, okay, to judge how big things are underwater, right? You're wearing those goggles, and you're looking through the water, and the light is refracting, and, oh, my goodness, it's a whale, and then it ends up being a little manini, and you brag about it like it's this big, but it's really this big. It's difficult. Kumu, like kumu, my, one of my favorite fish, goldfish. It has to be 12 inches. Um, I'm pretty sure the last time I speared kumu, which was, I was looking at pictures recently, okay, it was with Emmy, okay, I'm pretty sure the last kumu I speared was not 12 inches. I might be self-incriminating myself here, but it, it takes distinction, okay, you need to be able to discern how big is the thing. Is it big enough? A uh, height, a uh, weight, length, okay, their time of year, okay, uh, you can't take ula and ula papa'a, okay, um, um, during um, the summer months. For me, growing up, it was always June, July, August. Did you guys know now that it extends to May? It's May now. Oh, boy, I would have been in trouble if I hadn't looked up those laws recently, okay? You can't take lobster in May now. Okay, oh, I'm in trouble, okay? Praise the Lord, okay? When we go on the men's dive, okay, a slip of lobster is still in season. We can take them, okay? We have to use discernment in everyday things. When I was walking through that fun factory, I probably could have used a little bit of discernment, right? I mean, I, in the back of my head, there wasn't a sign that says, don't shake, okay, the coin machine. But in the back of my head, I probably could have figured out, you know, I probably should, that probably wasn't a wise thing for me to do. We have to use discernment every single day in our, in our daily walk. Um, Proverbs chapter 1, okay? It starts with this, okay? If you guys are taking notes, okay? Four things very quickly. If you want to develop discernment, not just telling the difference between right and wrong, but between right and almost right, Let's always start with the scripture. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And then he reels off this list of to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety. Ooh, that's a great word when we're talking about discernment. To give subtlety to the simple. Oh, excuse me. To give subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. I think that might be my favorite verse in the whole passage. Verse number five, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. Verse number six, to understand a proverb and the interpretation. Verse number seven, the fear of the Lord. Okay, My son, verse number eight, hear the instructions of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. In all of these things, the Bible is consistently talking about things like learning and discernment, but the ultimate, the, the jewel okay, of Proverbs is wisdom. In chapter four, it says, get wisdom, chase wisdom. Pursue after it, okay? The idea of wisdom. So if you and I want to develop discernment, do you struggle with not just telling the difference between right and wrong, but right and almost right? Get wisdom. It's found here, okay? There's no other, there's no other, there's no other option but to study the scriptures. Oftentimes I have teenagers come to me and they complain, okay? But that's natural, right? That's your normal default, right? Because it's not just teenagers, it's adults, the nation of Israel, what did they do in the wilderness? They murmured and they complained. Even when God took care of every single one of their material and physical needs, they murmured and they complained. And I have teenagers come to me all the time and they complain. Pastor Rob, why do we have this rule? Why do you, why do you say we can do that? Okay, My daughter, we were driving in the bus last week. 
And she pipes up from the back of the bus and she goes, Daddy, you know how it is when you're driving in a car and you have nothing to do, you have these random thoughts. She goes, Daddy, will we have bad words in heaven? I was like, oh no, I didn't, I didn't know what was going to come out of her mouth. Okay, What has she been hearing? What did she learn from her? Daddy, will we have bad words in heaven? And I was like, oh no, what is she going to say? She was like, will we have bad words like no. <laughs> no is a bad word in my family, apparently. There's another story that also, the phrase, go to sleep, that's also a bad word in our family. Okay? My kids, they're, they're clowns, they're hilarious. Okay? They don't know what's going on. Okay? That, that's, that's their level of morality. Okay? Well, well, anyway, what's my point? My point is, they, they, we, have this, we have this idealized view and, of, of what we think is right and what we think is wrong, but sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we are a little five-year-old in a bus who's asking their daddy real questions that they don't actually know the answer to. That's what it's like. Pastor Rob, why can't we do this? Daddy, why can't we do that? I, I, I think you're wrong, Daddy. Have you ever had your children come up to you and, and tell you to your face you're wrong? My, my kids do it all the time. And I tell them, firmly putting my foot down, go talk to your mom, ask her why. No, I mean, sometimes I do, okay? But sometimes I'm also like, well, do you know what the Bible says? Oh, that's, by the way, parents, that's a great thing to use. That's like, teenagers hate it when I pull out, oh, do you know what the Bible says? Oh, Pastor Rob, come on. Okay, because you can't fight against the Bible. Okay, you know what, it even gets better. Sometimes I say, do you know what the Bible says? And then they still complain. Oh, it gets worse, Brother Heaton. And you know what I say? Well, that's only what one verse says. Guess what? There's a whole lot of other verses in the Bible. And then I ask them the very pointed question, have you read all the way through the Bible yet? Like cover to cover. Have you read every single verse? Every single word, every single verse, every single chapter, okay? My wife, she just recently finished her, 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 her daily reading Bible plan. She read all the way through the Bible. I know my wife's done it. I've done it. I know you, many of you have done it. Somebody comes to you and complains about morality. I don't think that what you said, have you read the Bible all the way through? Oh, Pull out that big gun next time, my parents. Okay, next time your teenager comes and complains. Have you read the, what the Bible says? Oh, and by the way, be ready for them to pull the gun out right back at you. Daddy, will we have bad words in heaven? Okay, oh boy. Okay, it gets scary sometimes, but get wisdom. You, do you guys struggle with the difference? I mean, not right and wrong, but do you struggle with the difference between knowing what is right and almost right? That's discernment. Do you know what the whole counsel of the Bible says? That's what the Bible says. When Jesus, what did he do? When he, when he taught his disciples, he began at the beginning, and then he moved on to the prophets, uh, and, and, and he moved on to the law, and then he moved on to the prophets. And all of these things, all of these things were written to us for our, for our example. The Bible as a whole must be considered before you can make a step forward. And I know that's a really high standard but it's the only standard for making any kind of decision in your life. You want discernment in your life? Read your Bible every day. Read it all the way through. Read it more than once. Study it. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is in the very definition of the word discernment. You've got to learn how to divide things. You've got to learn how to separate things. You've got to learn how to analyze things. That's what we do. Wisdom, get wisdom. Number two, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. The Bible talks about this. Hey, once you read your Bible, well, don't, remember, don't, you can't just depend on one thing, okay, just the word of God. There is another tool that we've been speaking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses number 10 through 16. The Bible says in verse number 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his, what's the next word? Spirit. You need to be saved. You can't just read the Bible and follow it like an instruction manual. You have to allow the Bible to affect not just your head, but your heart. That's called salvation. That's called the, 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 the sanctification process. The more you read the Bible with a saved heart, the closer you draw to God, and He will work on you, and He will change you. And it won't just be, I know what is the difference between right and wrong. I know the difference between right and almost right. You know what sanctification is? You know what the Holy Spirit does? It makes you want to do what is right. 
versus what is wrong. Because a lot of people, we know what is right and wrong, but we don't want to do what is right. We still want to do wrong. Can I get an amen? Maybe a subdued amen, not a happy amen, but an amen. I'm 39 years old. I've known what was right since I was three. But that doesn't mean I want to do the right thing every single day. But I do know this. I do know this. The longer that I have spent time with Jesus, the longer time that I've spent around godly people, and I've seen the example of godly people in my church, the example of my parents, the example of my pastors, the example of just even my friends. Sometimes it's even my kids. Sometimes I see God working in my kids, and I go, man, my teenagers are a little bit more holy than me today. I need to step it up. Pastor Rob is slacking a little bit, okay? Daddy is slacking a little bit. Husband is slacking a little bit, okay? I like to say that I'm an amateur dad and I'm a participation award husband, okay? I'm not like a prize husband. I'm like participation award level, okay? I'm getting there. I'm not a pro dad yet. I'm an amateur, okay? I'm getting there. Guys, that's the sanctification process. That is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you. And get this. Oh, my favorite part. You read the, you read the passage. Oh, but the kicker is here. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says this. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What does that sound like? That sounds like discernment. There are some things that are spiritual, and there are some things that are even more spiritual. Okay? Did you know that you can go from a state of not just bad to good, but good to better, and better to best? That's sanctification. You are becoming more spiritual. Without being holier than thou and saying I'm better than any other Christian. No, we're not like that. We're not being Pharisees. But every single day, you and I, if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and the Word of God to work in us, guess what? We become more spiritual. Me and Pastor Trey were just talking in the office today. Man, we can see some spiritual immaturity in ourselves, in our families, and in this congregation. But you know one of the most beautiful things is? Is that spiritual maturity, okay, God promises that he will do a work in us. His word will not return to us void. He will finish and accomplish the work that he started in us, but you've got to do the work too. And then he says, verse number 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you may have head knowledge of what the Bible says, but you don't have heart knowledge. You don't have a spiritual life. You have a carnal life. The Bible says, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Do you guys have a difficulty determining not just between what is right and what is wrong, but what is right and almost right? You need the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you need the Word. You need wisdom from the Word. You need the Holy Spirit. And then I want to leave you with two other things, and these are more of the encouragement. This is like the to-do thing. I know that you guys know that you need to read your Bible. I know. I know that you know where wisdom comes from. We just need to do it. I know that many of you here in this room have the Holy Spirit. You've asked Jesus Christ to save you. If you are unsaved today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, well, guess what? If you want to have discernment, you want, to, you, want to, you want to function better, you want to live according to God's plan for your life and have a successful and victorious Christian life, well, you got to get saved. And you got to let the Holy Spirit work on you and sanctify you. But from there, there's two more things. I want to take you to two more passages that I hope will help you and bless you. I know they blessed me today. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 14. There are some of us who have heard the word, the wisdom of the word, and we have gotten saved and we've got the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 14 says this, though. The context is, in chapter number 5, the author of the book of Hebrews is giving a warning to certain people, okay, to certain Hebrews. And he is saying to them, some of you are immature. When I was nine years old at that fun factory, and I shook that jeweled, okay, gambling case or whatever that was, I was very immature. I didn't know, I didn't know. I didn't know, okay? And that's how some of us are spiritually. The Bible says in verse number 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, okay? 
even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's that word again, discern. There's, that, there, there, there's our morality again, good and evil. Okay? The previous verses talked about how some Christians, they don't read their Bible. And they don't go to church. And they, they, don't, they don't allow the Holy Spirit to work on them. They don't, they don't allow the sanctification process to work on them. And they stay spiritually immature. It uses the illustration of milk. He says, some of you are babies. Some of you guys are acting like babies. That's what he's saying to them. Wow, wow, wow. You're throwing temper tantrums. You're doing immature things. You're doing dumb things. Okay, like, I mean, and, 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 he's, and he's imploring them. He's warning them. He's saying, listen, you've got to grow up. You can't drink milk forever. You can't just... Memorize, you know, John 3.16 and know the Ten Commandments, and that's where your spiritual life stops. No, you've got to keep going. You've got to mature. He says, because if you don't, then you're like a baby who can't handle meat. You can't handle deep things. When people talk to you about the Lord and deep things, Lord, and life, you don't get it. They try to give you spiritual direction, and you ignore it because you're a baby. You're immature. You can't receive it. Just like a baby can't consume a big, fat, Tomahawk steak. And I know some of you came straight from work and you are hungry right now. Isn't it an amazing thing to be able to bite into a big, thick, meaty steak and chew on it? That's what it's like in the Christian life. You can take a big old bite out of the Bible. What does, oh, what does Jeremiah say? Thy words were found and I did eat them. And some of you... You can't comprehend anything past Noah and the ark because you never spent time in the Word and you are immature. You can't handle what the Bible has to reach out and give to you, what God is trying to say to you. Mature. So get wisdom. Get the Holy Spirit. Number three, get maturity. And can I close with this? Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Discernment is not just a practice it's not just a science. It's not just read your Bible and pray. It's not just that. We often like to say, you know, in our, in our Baptist churches, we don't practice religion. We have a relationship. Religion is, I have to do this to please God, or he will strike me dead with lightning, or, or, from the, or, or, or hail, or fireballs from the sky. That, well, that, that, and yes, God does do that. We see that. Okay, but that's not what our relationship with God is. It's, it's not a religion. We don't do things out of, purely out of fear. We also do it because of love. We have a relationship with God. The same way that Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the garden before they came to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and their discernment, their, their, their morality was broken there in the garden. They had a relationship and they walked with God every single day. First John chapter 4 the Bible talks about having a relationship with God. It, it illustrates it in so many ways. It, it, says, it says, try the spirits in verse number one. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Every child, as they grow, they know the difference between their mom and their dad and everyone else. You guys ever read that little book, Are You My Mother? You know, with the bird. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know. Auntie Army knows. Little bird falls out of the nest. What does he do? He goes up to like a duck or a dog. Are you my mother? No. He doesn't know any better. He goes up to, I don't know, what was it, a cow? Are you my mother? No. He goes up to a giant crane, okay? A bulldozer, a caterpillar, whatever it is. Are you my mother? No. But when he sees his mother, he knows, oh, that's, that's my mother. Just like children, they know who their parents are. Not because... Not because of the, there's, there's, there's any kind of magical, mystical... No, it's because from the moment that they could see, and the moment that they could talk and, and walk, they have spent most of their waking moments with their mother, with their father. They, they, they know who are their people. They know who their ohana is. That's what it is. And there are some of us, we don't know the difference between God and the devil. Or try the spirits. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. And one of the reasons is because some of us, we think we know God because it's this idealized, social media, world-influenced, okay, comic book version of God. But it's not the real God of this. Again, have you read your Bible all the way through yet? 
It's the beginning of the year. It's only February of 2023. You still got a chance. Some of us think we know God, but it's an idol. Some of us think we know God, but it, it's, it's not the real God okay, of the Bible. Some of us think we know God, but it's the God of our parents, or it's the God of, of our friends, but it's not really, he's not really our God. We don't have a real relationship with him. Try the spirits. And then he says in verse number four, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you base your entire existence and you base your entire relationship on God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Satan will try to deceive you. The world will try to get you to sin and do things and trick you into doing what is wrong. But sometimes we won't even necessarily know what is right. But we know that in some way that if I do this thing, I know it will displease God. And yeah, we got to go to the scripture. And yes, we got to confirm. And yes, we got to, we have to do all this. But that's the number one thing. Discernment, the last key is you need to have a consistent relationship with God. Then notice what he says in verse number six. We are of God. John, he knew. Because he had a relationship with his Savior. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Oh, it gets even better. If you really know God, okay, and you are part of a church, church helps too. Because there's other people in here tonight, they know God. And you may not know the difference between right and wrong. You may not know the difference between right and almost right. But God will give you a friend. God will give you a mom or a dad. God will give you a peer. God will give you a deacon. God will give you a pastor. God will give you a Sunday school teacher. God will give you somebody, you may not even know them, but they're sitting right next to you. And you can watch their life and their testimony. And you, look, and you go, you know what? We know God. And we know who is of God. We, we have this, that's what church is. We keep each other accountable. We teach each other what is right. We, we, we exemplify what is right. And then the Bible says, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. You know where discernment comes from? It comes from relationships. I am thankful for the relationships that I have. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for the teenagers. I'm thankful for the adults. I'm thankful for the... I'm thankful for all of our... You know why? Because sometimes when our discernment falls short, the Bible says that the church comes all alongside and you'll have somebody tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, what's going on? Can I pray for you? Do you need help? Do you need counsel? Sometimes our best friends will ask us those pointed questions, those hard questions, those uncomfortable questions, and they help us with our discernment. Sometimes when you are struggling, what does the Bible say? The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. That's what a church is. That's what... A relationship with not just God, but his flock is. That's what the, his, his word is. That's what the Holy Spirit is. That's what it means to get discernment. Are you struggling with knowing the difference between right and wrong? Maybe not as much. But all of us, for the rest of our life, we will continue to struggle with the difference between what is right and almost right. Good versus bad versus better versus God's best for us. What are you struggling with tonight? What area are you lacking in? Ask God to help you. Ask God to give you a better devotional life. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. Ask God for better friends. Join a Sunday school. Take discipleship classes. We have, we have, four, we have four discipleship classes tonight that are helping each other, fellow church members, grow in grace and in wisdom. How's your relationship with Jesus? according to these four simple things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Lord, I thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, for this church. Lord, I thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, for how you use God's word and how you use God's people to change me and to shape me to become a better Christian. I pray that you would use us, Lord. I pray that tonight, Lord, you would help someone in this congregation, Lord, maybe who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that tonight would be the night that someone would walk up to them and ask them about their morality. 
who they believe in. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to lift one another up, to bear one another's burdens. Lord, when all of us are struggling with making hard decisions in life, I pray, Lord, that you would come alongside us with your word and with the Holy Spirit and with the people of God, and that you would uplift us. Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, help us to become discerning people. Help us, Lord, to make the best decisions that we can, Lord, for ourselves, for our families, for our church, Lord, for you. Lord, I pray that if there's any hard decisions that need to be made tonight, that they would be made. I'm going to ask the piano to start playing. Let's all stand together. If you need to do business with God, if you need to talk to someone, we have people here who can help. There are counselors who can talk to you about salvation. There's counselors who can help you with with making a decision from the Word of God, not just from man's wisdom, but from something. If there is something that you need to take care of tonight, you take care of it. Ask God to work in your hearts as the piano plays. Church family, thank you for being here tonight. I hope that helps. I pray that uh, the Lord goes with you this week. Uh, continue to pray for um, one another. Pray for, um, pray for Pastor Woodfin and Miss Dana. They travel back, I believe, on Saturday. So um, pray that they have a good trip and are healthy. Pray for one another. Um, we have a couple of immediate events that are coming up very quickly, okay? I'm just going to give these real quick, okay? Um, on Friday, okay, we have parent-teacher conference, so there's no school Okay, but we are also going to have our delayed youth activity. Okay, we had to reschedule because our bus was broken, okay, for a while. But we are going to go to the Ice Palace, okay, at 6 o'clock. So if you are a teenager, or even if you're not a teenager, and you would just like to go and hang out, okay, in a freezing cold ice box, okay, and turn left over and over and over again, okay, on ice. The teenagers really love Ice Palace. They're going to go. If you would like to come and participate, the line is kind of insane, but we're going to go anyway. Okay, we're going to try. Okay, so if you'd like to come, if your teenagers would like to come, we'd love to have them. The day after, Friday, Saturday, February 4th, we have two big things. Okay, we have, um, we have a La Nakila, okay, luncheon and outing for that Sunday school class. It's going to be at the Heaton's home, okay, on Saturday at 11 o'clock. And also at 11 o'clock on the church property, we are going to have a, um, we're going to have a baby shower for the lovely Miss Eve Grumbling, okay, and maybe Connor, too. Okay, maybe some of you guys pray about getting something for Connor. I asked Eve today, what does Connor want, okay? What does Connor want? I got him something. Okay, I got him a little present. Okay, so pray for them. Okay, so we're going to have those uh, events coming up. Of course, Sunday, we hope to see you guys back again. Um, and we have a few other big things coming up. Um, but um, continue to pray for one another. I'm going um, to ask Brother Ed Habal, if you wouldn't mind closing us in prayer. And uh, continue to pray for one another. I hope that you guys have a great rest of the week. And uh, Malama Pono. Okay, take it easy. Okay, go ahead. Time, Lord, we can um, just study your word, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray that um, help us to be obedient to your word, Lord. Um, to to know what the Bible says and to be. Um, obedient to, to follow your word. Lord, we pray for um, Pastor and Mrs. Woodfin as they travel. Keep them safe, Lord. We pray for all their events coming up, Lord. And we pray that everything we do would honor and glorify you. And we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.